Welcome to another evening of Food Literacy for All. We've got a great subject, perplexing, fascinating, and a great opportunity to talk about tonight. Before we get started with uh, this evening's introductions, just a couple of announcements. Let's see, let's see if I can, whoa. First of all, just like to remind everybody who, uh, who our sponsors are, both internal to the university and outside. Thank you very much, all these organizations, for helping us to bring this really interesting group of topics to all of you. A um, couple of things that are more timely. Uh, there's this wonderful program sponsored by the university called Semester in Detroit. I know I sent an announcement out about this recently, but I just wanted to remind everybody once again this program, the ability to apply for this program is just goes on for about another week now. And it's a great opportunity to learn more about many of the topics we've been covering this term, as well as others involved with living and learning in Detroit from Detroiters along with other U of M students. So I want to give a nice shout out to this program in case you're interested for next fall. Um, also, something that comes from one of you, a really interesting um, art exhibit coming up in April, so that's of course next month, but the deadline to apply or sign up for this is Saturday, March 31st. And this, if any of you are feeling very creative in visual media, this is a op great opportunity to put that, those I your ideas to work in an exhibit that's gonna happen, be happening on North Quad. And I think those are the announcements for tonight. So now I'd like to turn things over to Lily Fink Shapiro, one of our course team who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Catherine. Hey, everybody. Uh, hey, thanks for the response, Malik. <laughs> um, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Jonathan Bloom as our Food Literacy for All speaker this evening. And Jonathan, he's a journalist, a consultant, and a thought leader on the topic of food waste, or perhaps wasted food, as it's sometimes preferred to call it. Um, his contributions are so significant that he's been referred to as the original pioneer in the U.S. food waste movement. He's consulted for the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization and the Natural Resources Defense Council, and he's been featured in documentaries, including a documentary called Just Eat It, which was, I know, just shown a few months ago in Detroit and I think has also been shown here on campus um, earlier this year. And as some of you have read parts of Jonathan's 2010 book called American Wasteland, How America Throws Away Nearly Half of Its Food and What We Can Do About It, his book has brought him increased prominence and recognition at national and international levels. Now, I don't know, whatever you all might think of online reviews, Yelp, Amazon, things like that, I can't resist quoting uh, one reviewer's commentary about his book. <laughs> so I found this online today. This reviewer said, it's amazing how much I enjoyed reading about a subject that I didn't really want to hear about. Jonathan Bloom's book app was absolutely riveting, and his areas of exploration are so varied, complex, and well-described that I, quote, ate this book up like a Taco Bell triple crunch wrap. <laughs> this man has done his homework, and his writing method is so entertaining that you tend to forget that you are learning all kinds of horrible facts and truths about food waste in our modern world. So that's a little bit, a little bit about Jonathan. And um, just to quiz you guys, get out your clickers. I have a question to introduce him. Um, so which of the following is not true about Jonathan Bloom? A, he has a huge Tupperware collection. B, he goes by the name of Wasted Food Dude in his advice column. C, he hates eating leftover pasta. Or D, he studied history in college. I'll give you a second to click in, see what you think is not true about Jonathan Bloom. You can double check with Jonathan. Most of you are correct. To my knowledge, you're OK with eating leftover pasta, right? Loves it. <laughs> OK. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce Call of Jonathan. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, thank you for that kind introduction. I feel like you guys have gotten to know me a little bit better. Uh, thank you so much to Lily, Catherine, and Malik, and also Mariah for all of your hard work in putting this together. Uh, it's a, a real honor to be here, and I'm excited to be a part of what is sure to be an interesting evening. So uh, yeah, let's, let's get started. 
Uh, hold on one sec. Before I do, oh gosh, just a little bit thirsty here. Oh, <clears throat> sorry. Sorry about that. Almost there. Okay, that's better. Ah, okay, where were we? All right, uh, believe it or not, that was just a bit of theatrics. I don't litter everywhere I go, and I promise I will pick up those items and put them in the appropriate bin outside. Uh, but rather, I do that to remind you that not all that long ago, when we had something in our hot little hands and we didn't want it anymore, just throwing it on the ground was the normal course of action. And it wasn't until we got together and decided to do something about that with, with a little bit of policy that we changed that behavior. And so now not only is littering uh, against our mores, but it's against the law. And that was in part because we as a culture decided we were going to get away from that behavior. And so you had campaigns like the venerable Litterbug campaign to stamp out that behavior. And it worked. But I say all that to, to point out that contrastingly, we are not doing anything close to that to stamp out a similar, similarly foolish behavior of wasting food. And so not only is throwing away food condoned, but it's widespread. It's the normal course of action and it happens not only on campuses like these, but everywhere throughout our food chain. So hopefully by the end of tonight's talk, I will have convinced you that food waste is a topic worth tackling, but it's one that we can actually do something about. So let's get into the specifics here. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how much we're wasting get into some of the whys and wheres behind wasted food in America, focus on the impact on why it matters that we're wasting so much of our food, and then finish up with the all important what we can do about our food waste problem. Okay, so let's get into some numbers here. On a global level, one third of, of the food available for consumption is not consumed. Closer to home in the US, that number jumps to 40%. So that was the uh, close to half of our food supply that we're not eating. And, and that's all the food available for consumption. 40% of that isn't being consumed, isn't getting to people to, to eat that food. And that certainly adds up to about 160 billion pounds and comes at a, a pretty significant cost, as you can see at the bottom there. Uh, but you know, those are just numbers and sometimes it's easy to see numbers and not really have a picture of what that looks like. So I like to include images whenever I'm, I'm trying to impress upon you the scale of this problem. And so here's one for you. You might know this stadium. Well, this is the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California. And that tiny little 90,000 seat stadium could be filled every day with the food that we in America are wasting. And so that's a little image for you. And in case you're wondering what that might look like a little closer to home, well, sure enough, America's wasting enough food every day to fill the big house. And yes, I do know that, that Michigan Stadium's a tiny bit bigger than the Rose Bowl, but uh, the truth of it is we're basically filling the Rose Bowl twice every day, and I erred on the side of caution when I wrote that, that we're filling it every day, but uh, we're almost double filling it every day. So uh, a pretty impressive amount of waste in this country. So where is that happening? Well, the short answer is everywhere, and we're wasting food at all steps of the food chain, and that starts at the farm level where a lot of times things never leave the farm. This is uh, an iceberg 
operation, iceberg lettuce operation out in California that I visited. And that is after the harvesters have gone through and, and picked what they're going to, to pick from that field. And as you can see in the close up, you know, these are, are perfectly good heads of lettuce that are left in the field because the pickers know that they would not survive that cross country journey. The waste continues on at the supermarket level driven by a few factors, but most significantly by the packaging and uh, perhaps the dates stamped on that package. And so supermarkets are, are a large source of our waste as well. And the waste continues on at the restaurant or even cafeteria level. And uh, this, this picture actually comes from a place called Reed College. And uh, I don't know if anyone is familiar with that little school, but they have this wonderful, quirky practice called uh, uh, where, where basically a bunch of, of students called scroungers, uh, they decided a long time ago that they're not going to get a meal plan. And they're just subsisting off the leftovers of their peers. And they have a, a scrounge table set up near the tray return. And uh, I, I went out and, and scrounged with the, the folks at Reed one day. And, and this was bowls of pasta that the scroungers decided that they weren't going to eat. So that's essentially food that's been wasted twice, uh, been passed over two times. Uh, anyhow, the, the waste continues on to the household level. And uh, this might look something like your household refrigerator, hopefully not. But we often fill our refrigerators to the point that we couldn't possibly use all that food before it goes bad. And so we're essentially buying waste by, by cluttering up our refrigerator. OK, um, I wanted to get into our, our first poll question. Let's see if, if we can do that now. Um, so we talked a little bit about, oops, oops. Hold on a sec. What do I want to do? Oh, it's yeah. going to come up? OK. Um, no, we haven't. We're in the While we're working on this, the question is, what food is most wasted in the food system? So the percent of the entire supply. Any guesses out there? Oh, this is fun. This is, uh, this is for the entire supply chain. Yeah, so from farm to fork. Uh, this is global. What an advanced crowd. You can ch does that change your answer? Ah, interesting. OK. Um, well. All right, that looks good. Well, surprisingly enough, the answer is actually A. And I, I know it's a little bit of a curveball because I didn't really talk about seafood at all. But at the, the, the primary production level, uh, that includes farms, but also uh, livestock operations and, and fishing operations, there's a tremendous amount lost because of what they call bycatch, uh, fish the wrong kind of fish caught. Um, and so stuff that, that wasn't intended to be caught ends up being caught in the net and often doesn't get used. Uh, in addition, at the, the consumer level, at the market, and then in our homes, there's a sense of perishability about uh, seafood. So we tend to be a bit squeamish about that. OK, um, back to the presentation. OK, so what are some of the root causes here? What's going on with our food waste problem? Well, there are several big ones. And I'll go through them one by one. But uh, first and foremost, there's an abundance factor with our food system. And what I mean there is that 
we just have a lot of food. Uh, we produce about twice the amount of food that we need on a per calorie basis. Uh, so it's not terribly surprising that we turn around and squander roughly half of our food. Uh, and so you have entire fields that aren't harvested because maybe the price of that good doesn't justify the, the harvesting of or the expenditure to harvest that crop. Maybe the, the market price isn't quite right and so it's just left in the field. Uh, and so this picture here comes from a gleaning outing in my home state of North Carolina. And those are all sweet potatoes that had been passed over and would have been plowed under were it not for a bunch of volunteers who decided to go out and, and pick some of those sweet potatoes. But that p image there is just a fraction of, of what was recovered. And we could have been out there for a week and still not harvested all of the sweet potatoes uh, left in that particular field. And that speaks to the, the sheer level of abundance that's happening across the country. Uh, the other thing I should say about uh, abundance is that because we have so much of it uh, on a psychological level, we, we just don't value our food as much as people elsewhere do or, or some people who might not have enough food. So simply walking into a supermarket and seeing all of the choices and seeing that, that level of abundance, uh, roughly 60,000 individual unique items in a store, and seeing food piled from floor to ceiling, that, that creates this notion in our mind that, that we don't have to be careful with our food. And as a result, we are not. The next factor here is beauty or appearance. And uh, what I mean there is that we want our food to look a certain way. We want it to look perfect, essentially but we also want it to be homogenous, especially with produce. So if there's any food item that's the wrong shape, size, or color, it will be cast aside at some point in its journey from farm to fork. And this gentleman here is a guy named Nick Avisevich, who runs an orchard in California in Lakeport. And I visited him and, and he was trying to explain to me why certain pears were left behind after the harvest. And he kept pulling pears from the tree to show me the imperfections, and, and he, he kept getting pears that looked pretty perfect. And, and he started to get a little frustrated because it, what, what was happening was that he was having a hard time finding the imperfection. They, there were no imperfections. And when he finally did pull down some that, that were slightly blemished. Uh, it was something minor, like you see there. And um, that speaks to a couple of things. One, the, the perfection demanded by retailers. And uh, two, the, the labor question, uh, where he could only find people to come through once. Um, whereas in years past, there was a larger labor supply. and and he could find pickers to come through at the beginning of the season, the middle, and the end. Um, but that, that one fell swoop led to a lot of perfectly good pears left behind, and then later on uh, led, led to this pile at the bottom of every tree. And uh, no farmer wants to see that. No, no person wants to see that, but especially growers who, from my experience, get into the business of farming to provide food for people, not to see it go to waste. OK, the next factor with our food waste is cost. And uh, despite rising food prices, when you look at the percentage of our household spending that goes toward food, it's near all-time lows. It's less than 10% of, of what we spend of, uh, of our household income. And no other nation spends as little on food. So like with abundance, that, that leads to a, a real psychological impact on not valuing food. Because frankly, it's, it's pretty cheap in the scale of things. Uh, I, I like this slide because not only does it convey the, the inexpensiveness of food, but it has a nice bit of cultural insensitivity, which uh, is actually pretty timely. So. 
make sure you get your, your spare ribs for Passover. <laughs> it's not just for Easter. Uh, but anyway, uh, I should say that, that this cheapness is largely an artificial one driven by subsidies on particular crops, on commodity crops. And so much like with gasoline, uh, we're not really paying the true cost of our food. And perhaps if we did, uh, we would value that food more. All right, the next driver of waste is the, the portions that we see oftentimes when we go out to eat. Uh, I'm going to be real honest with you here. I have no idea what that's a picture of. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing it involves eggs and cheese and gosh, a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, but uh, I'm pretty sure that the, that's not an uncommon sight, uh, especially in a college town. And unfortunately, we're, we're often put in this bad position where we are overserved or we get too much food. And in that case, we have a couple of choices. You can either overeat or waste food. Sometimes there's enough to do both. You could probably eat too much and still have plenty left over to throw away. Now, a, a third way, the, the middle road would be to take that food home, but people might not be going straight home. There's some strange people out there who don't like leftovers. So uh, hopefully the, the more sane solution is to avoid that situation, but that will take a bit of doing because a lot of our food operations now are, are built on this notion of, of scale equals value. And that leads to a lot of waste in this country. Uh, the next issue here is a, a loss of food knowledge. And, and that's been a big factor in seeing our food waste rise dramatically in the last generation. And what I mean there is that, that we basically stepped out of the kitchen as a culture. And some of those traditional food ways that have made this, this country's food culture great, those haven't been passed down. And so there's been a loss of, of kitchen know-how. And we're not sure how long foods last. We, we, we don't really know the tricks and, and little shortcuts for making food last and, and using up leftovers. And so what we have instead are, are reminders like this one on uh, a package or, or a take-home container that I received a few years back. And it's saying at the bottom there, when in doubt, throw it out. And I actually saw a similar saying on uh, one of the compost bins here, which I found interesting. But I think that's the exact wrong message to be sending. Uh, you know, we, we're already doing that, frankly. And if you read the fine print on that box there, it says to, to use the leftovers within 24 hours. And that might be good advice if you don't have a refrigerator but seems a bit excessive if you do have one. And so we're constantly receiving messages like that, and that leads to this, this sense that if you are in doubt, if you're a bit squeamish about something, and, and if you don't know how to tell if something's good or not, then, then it'll end up in the trash or maybe the compost. And another factor here uh, with, with that loss of food knowledge, well, there's there's a real void there, and, and into that void you see all kinds of date labels or expiration dates. And just about everything has a date label these days. So it's not just on the bottle of milk, but it's, it's on bottles of water, which I find a bit strange. Uh, even bottles of vinegar, which is a curing agent that helps other things stay good. And even on individual eggs, as you see there. So uh, we're, we're kind of feeding into this, this paranoia about things going bad with these date labels. And you probably know that they're a bit excessive, but uh, you, you might not know to what extent. And the USDA actually recommends that, that you can use food items past the date stamped on the package. And this gets into a whole discussion, but 
just know that there's a fair amount of caution built into those date labels. OK, um, and I wanted to ask a question on that topic. Uh, let's see if this pulls up. Excellent. Uh, how do I get to the next one? OK, great. OK, so yeah, what's the, the question here is, what is the only food item required by federal law to have a date label? or expiration date. All right, looks like the results are in. Yeah, milk is the runaway winner. OK, well, you know what? This is actually a trick question. Uh, I, I thought you might answer that. It's actually infant formula. That is the only thing required by federal law to have a date label on it. So go figure. Um, the, the thing about the date labels is that there's a, a whole web of state laws, and then there are local laws. The only overarching federal requirement is to have a date label on infant formula. And everyone thinks that, that we have to have these date labels on them, and there's no other way, but that's not really the case. And so there, there's plenty of maneuvering that can be done to minimize the, the amount of date labels and the confusion that they cause. OK, um, yeah, so here's, here's a really important question that you might be wondering at this point. What's the big deal? We're wasting a lot of food, but we have a lot of it. So seems fine, right? Well, there are several reasons why this food waste issue is one that we need to conquer. And, and I believe it, it's important to focus on the ethical dimension first. And so when you think about the, the ethics of food waste in a country that, that still has plenty of hunger, there might be a, a saying or expression that comes to mind. And I'm wondering if, if any folks out there heard something growing up, maybe at the dinner table uh, when, when you were a kid, or maybe it's something you tell your children now. Um, yeah, call it out. Waste not, want not. That's a good one. There are kids starving in Africa. So what should I do about it? What can you do? What, what's the other part of that? Yeah, eat your food. Yeah, clean your plate. That's something I heard a little bit as a kid. Clean your plate because there are children starving somewhere. And the somewhere tends to shift with generations. Uh, when I was young, it was, uh, was Africa, this sort of generic notion of Africa. Not, not very specific, is it? Uh, my parents' generation, I think they talked about people starving in China, uh, which now seems a bit strange. But um, the point is there are people hungry everywhere. And to, to have this, this sense of entitlement where we don't need to be careful with our food while there are hungry people everywhere, uh, all throughout our country, around the corner, um, you know, there's, there's a real problem despite our massive wealth. So that's, that's what I consider the grand paradox here with food waste, is that we have this coexistence of hunger and waste and to me, to allow that to happen is morally callous and is, is reason for, for us to pay attention to the amount of food we're throwing away and to do something about it. So you see the numbers there. And whether you're talking about globally or domestically, there's a tremendous coexistence of hunger and waste. And that's something that, that we can have an impact on. Uh, I mentioned there are hungry people everywhere, and I'm always amazed when I talk to certain groups, they, they get this image of the Great Depression when they think about hunger, and, and they think that, that this isn't something we're still struggling with, but it's quite the opposite. Uh, as I've said, there's a, a, a huge problem in this country with food insecurity or hunger, and it has shifted a tiny bit where, in some places, it's more of a nutrient hunger of, of not having the right kinds of foods. But the main point is, is that there is tremendous need out there. 
and there's a lost opportunity with the amount of food we're throwing away. And, and so that's, uh, to me, a, a real disgrace of this country and this culture is that, that we haven't paid attention to that and we haven't committed ourselves. We don't have the social, cultural, or political will to actually tackle poverty, which is the root cause of hunger. And um, it's not like it would take that much doing, uh, as you see there, just redistributing 2% of the calories that we're currently wasting would be enough to lift all of the 42 million food insecure Americans above that, that line of hunger and, and food security. So you could look at it really negatively and, and say, shame on us, but I, I try to frame things positively and, and say, this is an opportunity and it's something we can really do and we can really achieve if we set our mind to it. So hopefully we do that and soon. Uh, shifting gears a touch, uh, the next impact here that, that's quite significant is an environmental one. And when I think about the environmental impact of our food waste problem, uh, what I'm getting at is there's a real squandering of natural resources. And so our our carbon footprint or food print is pretty significant. We're putting a lot of, of oil and water and, and our land supply into growing food. And so when we turn around and squander that food, it's basically like wasting those natural resources. We're using all of that oil and water and, and land, soil, for, soil fertility, et cetera, in vain. Uh, so with the oil topic in particular, uh, there's a few estimates up there, but if we were to dramatically limit the amount of, of waste that we're creating, that would be similar to taking one in four cars off the road. So uh, a pretty significant change there. But when I'm trying to impress upon you the importance of this issue or the scale of it, you know, the, the number there at the bottom, 4% of all U.S. energy consumption goes into producing food that is ultimately wasted. I mean, that's a massive amount of energy or oil, but 4% doesn't really sound like much. So, you know me, I like images. So here's a, a, a different one for you. This is the, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill from a few years back and obviously that was a, an ecological disaster and we're still recovering from that in the Gulf of Mexico but every year America wastes 70 times that amount of oil through the food that's not eaten so every year we're we're wasting 70 times the amount of oil spilled in the Deepwater Horizon leak uh, so yeah quite a catastrophe but Hey, at least we got a movie out of it, right? Okay, uh, I talked a little bit about water. Here are some numbers on, on how our, our wasted food means a waste of water. And as the uh, planet gets a little warmer, we're going to have an even more uh, water-intense agricultural system. So this issue will become even more important. But yeah, about a quarter of fresh water usage in this country goes to grow food that is ultimately squandered. Uh, so we can certainly do a lot better. And to give you a sense of what that looks like, basically every year we're wasting a Great Salt Lake's worth of water through the food that we don't eat. And just to be clear, it's, it's fresh water. I know that's salt water, but fresh water that's being squandered. Okay, um, and the other significant environmental factor here is methane, and this is a, a real simple equation for you. This is my kind of math here. When we're putting food in a landfill, we're creating methane. And so food plus landfill equals methane. Um, basically, when food decomposes without air, uh, that, that anaerobic situation leads to methane emissions 
And methane is a greenhouse gas that is much more potent than CO2 at trapping heat, more than 20 times as potent as CO2. Uh, so essentially, we are aiding climate change from our kitchen waste bins. OK, um, on that topic, I wanted to, to get into one other question. Okay, uh, so um, as, as that's loading up, uh, basically the question is, this, this is a, uh, a diagram of, of countries uh, and their CO2 emissions uh, by country. And so the question is, what's the third largest emitter for carbon dioxide? Ah, there we are. Okay, so, so I've blocked off the answer there. And so you can respond to that. What's the third biggest emitter of CO2? Australia, Brazil, Canada, Fiji with all that bottled water, <laughs> or other? We need to get the Jeopardy song going. <laughs> Okay, the results are in. Oh, Brazil. Interesting. And Canada. Okay, well, yeah, this was, uh, this was a real trick question, as, uh, as I will show you in a second. So it's actually not a country. This is kind of a strange statistic. It's actually the global food loss and waste. <laughs> Uh, coming from this mythical nation of food waste landia. And uh, so this is an interesting way of thinking about the, the carbon impact of food waste. And I think it's kind of helpful in that it, it shows you the scale. Uh, I also really get a kick out of the symbol that they've created for this country. Uh, you know, talk about emblematic of food waste. I mean, there's a lot of apple left to be eaten there. And at the same time, the apple core is just this social construct. It doesn't even need to exist. Uh, I don't know if any, any of you have seen that, that video of, of someone eating an apple from the bottom. Uh, you know, we could eat an apple like a slice of watermelon and spit out the seeds, but we choose not to do that. So uh, just another way that, that waste of food is built into our culture. Also, a t-shirt that I'm thinking about marketing. <laughs> Quick show of hands, who would buy that shirt? Mm, OK, all right. Come talk to me afterwards. It's going to be my ticket out of here. All right, um, OK. So the third factor at play here are, are the economics of the situation. I touched on the, the value of our, our food waste at the top of the talk, but uh, really quickly to review, you know, domestically it's about 218 billion, globally 2.6 trillion, and uh, and I really like this statistic from the FAO. Uh, you can see here at the bottom, the they've broken it down on three levels, and and the food waste itself is one trillion, but they've tabulated the social and environmental costs of that food waste, and they're pretty significant as you can see. Uh, so. A pretty, a pretty hefty amount of, of money that's being thrown away along with our food. And hopefully that, that gets our attention, especially the last item there, about $2,000 per household annually that's wasted through food not, not eaten. OK, so on that topic, where do we go from here? What can we do about? America's wasted food problem. Well, there's this, uh, this mantra that, that you all have probably heard, reduce, reuse, recycle. And it's one that is very applicable here. But what I've noticed in, in my time in this space is that we so often focus on the second and the third items in that hierarchy. And in fact, we don't really even think of it as a hierarchy. But what we really need to do is focus on the first one, the reducing 
of waste. And so the problem there is that, that we don't like to change our behavior and reducing the amount of waste we create, whether it's, it's food or, or other kinds, uh, leads me to, to think that we're going to have to do things differently. And, and that's where the hard work lies. And so when you take that hierarchy of reduce, reuse, recycle and apply it to wasted food, you get this handy hierarchy here. And, and this is how I like to, to strategize about finding solutions. And as you see at the top there, source reduction. So trying to create less food waste in the first place. Uh, so focusing there is of the utmost importance. And if we can't do that, then let's try to get the excess food to people who need it. If that can't be achieved, maybe it's, it's not edible or, or maybe it's just not possible or feasible, then let's get that food to livestock or animals. Uh, so many cultures have, have solutions for that and so many animals have become domesticated as a way to, to convert excess food to protein. Uh, but if, if we can't do that, then the next best thing is this, uh, this sort of nebulous term, industrial uses. But basically that means anaerobic digestion or creating energy from our excess food or rendering. And if we can't do that, then composting is the next best thing. And only if we can't do any of the above should we be landfilling or incinerating our food. Unfortunately, in reality, we're, we're basically inverting that hierarchy. And 95% of America's food scraps end up in a landfill or an incinerator. So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, but so we talked a little bit about the impact, but, but to frame it positively, it's also an opportunity. And I don't know how many of you have seen the Project Drawdown conclusions or, or read the book, uh, but basically they, they came up with 100 solutions to mitigate against global warming. And the number three most impactful solution is to reduce food waste. And I was, I was pretty excited that, that that actual word was used, reducing food waste, not just uh, redistributing, as a lot of people are focusing on. So to me, that's exciting. And, and so how do we go about doing that? Well, I have some concrete suggestions for you as individuals, but thinking uh, on a national level, on more of a cultural and, and political level, uh, here are a few big ones. Uh, it's time that we make it illegal to throw away food, to, to stop people from landfilling organic materials that lead to the methane emissions. And it is a bit counterintuitive to focus at the end of that food chain, but I, I do believe that if we make that throwing away of food illegal, it will have a dramatic ripple effect back through all steps of the food chain. And so avoiding that, that easy solution of, of when in doubt, throw it out, will force us to, to plan ahead, to think more, strategize about why we have so much excess food and, and what decisions have led to that situation where, where we have this glut of, of, ex, of food and, and leads to all of the, the landfilling that we see today. Uh, so it's not just a pipe dream. Many states have, have bans, uh, California, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and, and some cities as well have, have gone ahead with that policy. And so I think it's, it's time that more states adopt that and, and maybe even we, we try and make that happen on a national level. So yeah, basically avoiding that situation. Uh, the next big thing that, that we really need to do is to bring this, this issue to kids and to basically teach kids that throwing away food isn't cool. Uh, and we live in somewhat of a throwaway society and so it's not surprising that, that we're, we're teaching kids that food is something that they could throw away, just like any other commodity. But uh, it's time that, that we flip that around and do the opposite and reach the, the next generation. And I think that starts in schools with school lunch. Uh, so having composting 
is, is kind of the, the least we could do, but more than that, trying to implement some solutions to, to avoid excess uh, behind the, the line in the back of the house, and then also to have some solutions when kids aren't going to eat what they're served. Um, having some kind of redistribution mechanisms. And there are a couple of nonprofits that are helping schools set up that redistribution from school lunch. It's not that hard. Uh, I, the next thing that, that we really need to do is, is keep talking about this issue and spread the word. And there is a really fabulous campaign out there. How many of you have seen the Save the Food campaign in some way, shape, or form? All right, a smattering of hands. Yeah, so it's, it is a, a national program, but they're kind of rolling it out city to city. And so it hasn't quite reached as many people as I would like, but it's kind of like the, the Smokey the Bear or Woodsy the Owl uh, model of, of an ad campaign that's created by the same people, that the, the ad council. And it's, it's a, a great way to, to get people thinking about this behavior and, and thinking about how they can avoid it. Uh, kind of gets back to the litter bug campaign that we saw at the beginning. And so hopefully uh, as this campaign spreads, We'll, we'll be able to think about it uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. And finally, the, the last big change I'd like to see is a, a fix on date labels. And there's been a lot of talk on this topic. Uh, the food industry has gotten together through the Food Waste Reduction Alliance and said that they're going to, to voluntarily change how they do these date labels and create uniformity. Uh, because there's so much confusion over what those dates mean. And as we mentioned before, that leads to a lot of perfectly good food being thrown out. Uh, so best if used by is, is the agreed upon standard. I haven't quite seen the adoption of that yet, so I'm still waiting on that. And, and there's an opportunity where maybe policy is the best option. Uh, if, if it's not going to happen voluntarily, then, then maybe that's uh, something we can write into code. Uh, you know, there isn't a federal requirement for these labels at all, but maybe there should be some sort of federal driven, uh, federally driven regulation on what the language should be and just make it clear for people. Uh, if you're treating those, those date labels as the gospel truth on when your food's going to be going bad, you're throwing away a lot of good food. And I really despise that term expiration dates because food doesn't just expire at midnight on the date stamped on the package. It's not really how things work. Uh, those date labels really speak to quality of the food. So it's really about the taste and texture, not about the food's safety. But that often is lost uh, when it's stamped in, uh, in ink on the package. People equate that with uh, a finality on, on that date. So it's time to move past that. Okay, so those are some bigger changes, but what can we as individuals do? What can you do? So this is me pointing the finger at you, all, all the folks in this room. Uh, we're all collectively responsible for wasting about 40% of our food as a nation. Uh, in our households, it's about 25%, but, but so that means that, that we can all be part of the solution. So. There's, uh, there's plenty we can do here, but I think my, my overarching bit of advice is to connect with your food, to get to know your food better. And, and that's why I think this class is so fabulous, because you're doing just that. And you're learning where your food comes from, you're learning that your decisions have an impact, and that you have some authority and, and autonomy over our food system. So, Connecting with your food might mean growing your own. It might mean just buying from a, a local producer, shopping local, uh, supporting local farmers. Or maybe it's something as simple as cooking, which doesn't sound so radical, but in these busy times, you know, it might feel that way. And so I'm here to say that, that cooking isn't that hard. I mean, we can all give it a try. Uh, you know, kids can do it. Cats can do it. 
I think you'll be able to subsist. Uh, next thing that we can do is be wise on portion size and uh, basically take what you eat, take what you will eat and eat what you take. Uh, that might be a bit of an extreme there, that image. Maybe that's a, uh, a bit too uh, little, but basically trying to avoid that situation, uh, trying to avoid the, the excessive portions that frankly can lead to obesity and food waste, two problems in one. Um, so, so plenty we can do there, including sharing an entree or, or asking your server what the portion sizes are like, uh, or maybe even just not patronizing restaurants that, that deal in that kind of equation where value equals mass. And so I think increasingly our role as smart food consumers is going to be to shift what value looks like. And so value might not be the biggest bang for the buck, but maybe the, the best food possible for your food dollar, the, the, the healthiest or the most local, the most sustainable. You'll define what that is for you, but I think that's something worth considering. And uh, here at, at the college level, uh, one question that, that I always like to raise is maybe this uh, all-you-can-eat cafeteria model is, is part of the problem, not part of the solution. And uh, basically, in order to always have enough, by definition, you're going to have to have too much uh, to keep refilling the buffets and have that, that full-looking lunch or dinner line all day, uh, especially with unlimited dining. Uh, you're going to, to have a lot that's put out there that then can't be reserved. And so there's some solutions there that some strategies to mitigate against waste, but uh, we maybe should rethink how we're doing that kind of college food service operation because uh, that's sort of taken as, as the dogma on, on how we do food at a college level, but uh, maybe paying per pound, uh, maybe that's a, a little better way to do it. Uh, anyway, if you do get too much food when you're out to eat, it's really important to uh, go with the doggy bags. But not that kind of doggy bag. <laughs> Definitely not that kind of doggy bag. But rather this kind. And, you know, when you have too much food, trying to, to bring it home eat it the next day. To me, the, the best lunch ever is last night's dinner. But if you're one of those odd people who don't like leftovers, maybe make it a, a bit of a game. Uh, think of it as a, a cooking show. See what you can create from your leftovers. And uh, I think you'd be pleasantly surprised with what kinds of deliciousness you can create. Uh, you know, it's, it's the eco-conscious thing to do. It's it's uh, a wise use of money, and uh, it's something I think we can all get better at. Uh, if you're grocery shopping, for those of you who are cooking already, uh, it's, it's important to think about how you go about bringing food into your house and avoiding that, that situation where you're, you're filling your fridge with too much food. So maybe it means making fewer trips, or sorry, making more trips, but, but buying less food each time, and being a bit more nimble with your food supply. But if you are going to make that big weekly shopping trip, then it's really important to plan out your meals and make a detailed shopping list and stick to that list in the store, uh, resisting some of those temptations that you see in the supermarket left and right. Uh, anyways, if you do make a list, just be careful who has access to it, what ends up on that list, because it can get a bit dicey, as you see there with the snakes. I'm still looking for a grocery store where I can find snakes, but <laughs> I think it was supposed to be snacks. <laughs> We're working on spelling. <sighs> OK, um, but the key point here is to avoid this situation. Uh, don't fill your refrigerator to the point that you can't use all that food. Out of sight is out of mind. So, so we often 
aid our, our own household food waste through clutter. Uh, next bit of advice would be to, to try and find oddities and, and ugly produce. Uh, this has been a pretty hot topic lately. Uh, it's kind of exciting to see some of these odd-shaped produce items ending up in our store. Uh, for a number of years, I've advocated for this topic, but now here's the, here's the thing. If you have the opportunity to buy them, you have to buy them. Uh, so many retailers and supermarkets have said they'd love to expand the, the definition of what's acceptable, but they know their shoppers don't want to buy those items. So now it's our turn if you have the opportunity to buy ugly fruits and vegetables, knowing that it's what's on the inside that counts, then you have to do so. And uh, I mean, gosh, it sort of sounds like a Hallmark card. And the least you could do is, is give these poor oddities a home um, and, and not judge the book by its cover. So I think there's some, some neat allegory there for life, uh, but also some concrete advice on minimizing food waste by providing further markets for, for growers, for farmers, to sell goods that, that don't look homogenous and perfect. OK, um, the next bit of advice is to ignore expiration dates. Now, I know that is uh, rather controversial advice. My team of lawyers have tried to get me to take out this slide, but I won't do it. Uh, don't sue me. But the reason I'm confident in that advice is because we, as a species, have evolved for millennia, and we have these highly developed senses. Uh, get ready for this. This is going to be revolutionary. Sense of smell, taste, and sight. And with those three beauties, you are going to be able to tell when your food is bad and when it's still good. I have faith in you. And if you're out there wondering whether or not you'll be able to pull that off, uh, if, if maybe you're not sure if you've ever smelled bad milk, that means you haven't. <laughs> okay, you will know. And additionally, as I mentioned, those date labels don't speak to food safety. They're just about quality. They're just about the taste and texture. So uh, the, the advice, when in doubt, throw it out. I would like to flip that around and say, when in doubt, give it a smell. Have a look at it, maybe take a taste, and you'll know. All right, the last couple of, of bits of advice here. Uh, you, I talked a lot about reducing waste, and that's of the utmost importance, but we also need to try to redistribute the excess. And that will, will go a long way toward addressing the ethical question of, of hunger and food waste. And so there's a whole lot of great food out there that's been prepared that, that won't be served, that, that can't be served perhaps at a college cafeteria or at a restaurant or at supermarkets. And so there are a lot of uh, volunteer opportunities where you can be a part of the solution by helping to recover food. Uh, I know there's a, a Food Recovery Network chapter on campus here, and that's a great way to volunteer to, to redistribute food. Uh, now, prepared food is, is great, but I think on a larger scale, we need to think about trying to harness some of the agricultural excess and to get at some of the, the fresher, uh, more unprocessed foods. The, the, the farm level excess is where we really need to focus. Uh, farmers markets are a great place to do that because uh, those fabulous farmers have already done the aggregating. They've done a lot of that legwork. Uh, so, so getting to farmers markets is key. And then also trying to get to the farms themselves and where possible do some gleaning. And I don't know if, if anyone's had the opportunity to do that, but it's a great way to, to get out into a, a really beautiful setting and uh, be part of, of the minimization of food waste and the redistribution of excess at the same time. In many cases, you're doing the farmer a favor, uh, sort of helping their process along. But uh, wherever possible, I, I highly recommend gleaning. 
Uh, one other thing I should mention, that there's a bit of urban myth on uh, what's allowed to be redistributed or not. And a lot of supermarkets or restaurants, would, they, they'll say that they would love to donate food, but they are afraid of being sued. And basically, that's nonsense. There's a federal shield law called the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act, which says donors who give food that they deem to be in good condition are protected from liability. So there is that shield law. There's a protection against liability if you're donating food to a nonprofit. And so the point there is that we can do a better job at redistributing. And supermarkets and restaurants and caterers can donate food that hasn't been put out, that, that consumers haven't had the chance to, to contaminate by sneezing on or putting the, the wrong spoon in the wrong bin. So there's a lot of food out there to be redistributed. OK, and finally, as with that hierarchy, the last thing that we can do is compost. Um, it's, it's kind of like the least we can do. Uh, if, you're, if you're not going to change your behavior to minimize your waste, if you're not going to try to redistribute that excess or, or feed livestock, then you should try to convert that food waste into a usable soil amendment, uh, try and pass those nutrients on uh, and, and use them for good. Um, I, I do hear a lot of people say that, that um, they don't waste any food because they're composting. And that's sort of missing the point, as we've talked about a bit here. You know, we put so much food into, we, we put so much resources into growing our food, uh, the least we can do is, is try to, to use it. Uh, composting is good. It, it recycles some of the, those nutrients, but it's not the be-all, end-all. Okay, uh, so plenty of, of work for you to do, lots of homework there. And just to, to frame this up and, and put a, a bow on things here, when we think about the stakes, uh, they're pretty high with our, our food supply. And the estimates are that by 2050, there will be 9.5 billion of us on this planet. And that's a lot of zeros there and a lot of mouths to feed. So a lot of people see those numbers and they jump to these conclusions like we're going to have to turn to GMO on a widespread basis or we're going to have to cut down more forest land to create more arable farmland. And that may or may not be so. That's kind of another conversation for another night. But from my standpoint, before we turn to those radical solutions or even other ones, let's try to be more efficient with the food that we do have. And there are simple solutions to be had here, and there are plenty of answers for our wasted food problem. And on a, a real basic level, we have enough food here to feed everyone. So let's get out there and, and try to do a better job of getting food to people who need it and using our food supply in a positive way. So with that, I will end things. And I'd love to hear your thoughts and questions. Thanks so much for your time. All right. Um, I think we have a couple of microphones, so don't be shy. Hi, thank you for this. I think this is such an important topic, and I was super excited for you to come in. So thank you for your speech, first of all. Oh, thanks. Um, and one question. I know a lot of people recommend government um, funding for different like programs and organizations as a way to kind of get that pushed along um, on the federal level, but how can you do that? Or like, how, one, how can the government get funding um, when there's so many things fighting for that funding already um, for this particular topic? And two, um, I know another argument is like switching the subsidies, um, so it's not just for corn and soy, but how do you do that without injuring the farmers that are subsidized for that currently? Yeah, nice. oh, good questions. Um, well, let's see. To answer the first question, sort of how do you do that on a federal level where it's so competitive for funding, uh, I like to, to look back 
not too long ago, about, uh, about 20 years ago, the USDA had a, a food waste reduction coordinator. Uh, this, this guy named Joel Berg in the Clinton administration. And his role was to go through the federal apparatus and, and try to make people aware of the, the money that they are wasting in these different federal agencies and to also try to raise awareness at the farm level. And if you do that, I mean, it basically will pay for itself. I mean, there are plenty of cost savings to be had if you're minimizing waste. Uh, the, the GAO used to, to be involved in this whole topic uh, just from a, a common sense standpoint of, of accounting. Uh, let's try to minimize waste in the government. So there's an opportunity there uh, to this date. Well, at this point, there's no one in the federal apparatus of more than two million people whose sole focus is to think about wasted food. So, uh, you know, I think having one, maybe two people who, whose job it is to think about this issue and spread that word uh, will have a, a dramatic effect and would help that funding question. Uh, and then the second question was, remind me again? Oh yeah, subsidies and, and how you go about that without hurting farmers. Yeah, I mean, the Farm Bill is, is a, a giant mess, frankly, a uh, really complicated topic, and I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on it, but I do think that there's an opportunity here to, to think about how we do subsidies, and I know there's a lot of opinion on a lot of people thinking that possibly we should change what does get subsidized. And it has some negative effects uh, in terms of overproduction of, of corn and soy, and especially with corn, where a lot of it is turned into corn syrup, which harms our health. And so maybe rethinking that is something we can do. And, and farmers can grow different crops. Uh, right now, the main commodity crops are ones that they focus on because it behooves them to do so economically but they can be nimble and, and shift how they grow some of their food. And I also think there should be some, some more clarity on what kinds of foods uh, will lead to tax deductions if donated. And we can and try and get some of that excess food harvested and redistributed from the farm level. And right now we're basically relying on volunteer lab labor through gleaning and the goodwill and kindness of farmers to, to do the harvesting to then donate it. So I think there's a, a way to be smarter about that. Thanks. Yeah. So I noticed that um, your presentation, um, not exclusively, and kind of a lot of other things that I see about food waste tend to focus a lot on individual food waste. And I was wondering if, um, you had suggestions for maybe industries or like large businesses that do a lot of food waste uh, about how to change that kind of behavior because I feel like, or at least, I mean, I know that there's a, like a lot of social barriers to being able to reduce your own food waste that maybe a lot of people can't meet. Um, like maybe they don't have a compost bin or they can't afford to get one or they don't know what it is or the kind of food that they can afford to purchase has a lot of like packaging or extra waste associated with it. Mm, okay, so yeah, what, what can industry do? Because a lot of the focus is on consumers. And the reason that we focus on consumers so much is because the numbers say that's where the largest amount of waste happens at the consumer level. Uh, I don't tend to talk about that tons because I don't think we've studied the farm level loss nearly well enough. So those numbers to me are a bit incomplete. Uh, but anyhow, you're right. We do focus on consumers in large parts because you know, we are the people who can, can change our own shopping habits, our own cooking habits, et cetera. But industry certainly has a role to play here, and, and they are doing things. Uh, every year, more and more businesses will go out of their way to streamline operations. And to be fair, it's in their economic best interests to do so. Uh, so it's not too surprising that, that you see uh, a company like IKEA uh, putting in this, this waste measurement process where they saved a million meals last year, uh, according to their data. Uh, but, but I find tracking data is, or sorry, tracking waste and getting data on how much uh, you're not using 
is the first step, and that leads to a lot less waste at the industry level. And we talked a lot about what's happening in the US, but globally, uh, especially in the developing world, there's a lot more loss in the supply chain. And there's a lot of focus on trying to make that supply chain more streamlined, uh, better infrastructure, more refrigeration, and make that equation so that there isn't as much loss in the developing world in getting food from, from farm to people. So there's, there's plenty that is going on, and, and there's also some more that can be done, um, partly through the, uh, the, the date label initiative that there's sort of been some, some lip service paid, but I haven't seen tons of, of action on actually streamlining and making that uniform. And, and that's why I think in the US, the food industry can do a better job. Yes, sir. Here comes the microphone. You've talked about the fate of food that goes into uh, landfill or into landfills and into composting. Um, composting is labor intensive compared to putting food in the disposal, which you haven't mentioned. And into the disposal is out of sight and out of mind. But could you talk a little about what happens to the food that goes into the disposal and how? Uh, it has an effect on the environment and on social costs. Mm. Oh, great question there. So, yeah, you're right. I, I didn't talk about the disposal. And part of the problem there is it depends where you live. Uh, different, some cities have anaerobic digesters set up where they can take that waste and turn it into energy. Um, most often it's ending up in the wastewater treatment facility and there isn't much uh, energy extraction. So it's, it's better than landfilling the food, but depending on who you ask, uh, the people who make waste disposers think it's better than composting. I think it's kind of between the two, between landfilling and composting. And uh, part of my bent a, a little bit against that is, as you hinted at, it's out of sight, out of mind. And I think if, if that food waste sticks around, you see what you're not using, and you might change your strategies and uh, do things a little bit differently. And that's one of the real benefits of composting is, you know, you have the compost bin on the counter, or I keep mine in the freezer, but um, you know, you see what's ending up in there. And, and you know, I, I talk about avoiding food waste, but there is food wasted in my house, and you know, we all have some, some mishaps and overestimates and what have you. So uh, it's, it's a nice opportunity to learn, whereas the disposal, it's just away, just like the trash. You mentioned um, cheap food as one of the reasons that food, that there's so much food waste at the household level. So, and that was for the US, the data that you gave. If you compare across countries, how much more expensive does food need to be as a proportion of household income before one starts to see the amount of waste go down in, uh, in households in other countries? Ooh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the linking of the, the price to less waste. There isn't that detailed of numbers on, uh, on waste by country. There's certainly expenditures by country on food. Uh, but most of the research tends to break down in, in big chunks like developed world, developing world. And uh, it is a, a pretty true relationship in that large picture of, you know, the more expensive food is, the more careful we are with it, the less waste happens. But, um, but yeah, there, I don't have specific numbers on that, but, but that is kind of a truism. But you raise an interesting question about should food be more expensive? And then that gets into a, a very different conversation about food access, uh, which I think that you all have discussed here, uh, and I, I'm sure you have, and, and I think needs to be discussed even more. But I wouldn't want anyone to think that I'm up here saying that food should be more expensive. Uh, that, that's a, a pretty hard stance to take, considering how much hunger or food insecurity exists in this country. 
but rather that we need to rethink how we do food and rethink things like the, the farm bill and subsidies that go into it and hopefully radically shake things up so that we have a more sustainable and, and just food system. Thanks. Uh, yes, on the, on the side. Okay, um, so I think some of the kind of behavior changes you mentioned, I'm just wondering how they would work for low income folks. So like the no all you can eat at like college, like um, cafeterias, frequent small shopping trips if people don't have access to like a reliable vehicle or if they're on public transit, um, picking small portion sizes. So I think a lot of times if you go to a restaurant for like 40 cents more, you can get more food and you might waste a little bit of that, but it makes more economic sense for you to do that. So I'm just trying to think of like, is it in the best economic interest of low income folks to not waste food, quote unquote? So if you could just speak a little bit more about that, mm. especially in light of what you guys just said about food costs. Yeah, oh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think it sort of depends if you're buying prepared food or cooking. Uh, I mean, from my experience, you save so much money by cooking your own food and you also take control over what you're putting in your body. Um, and I find that the, the bulk area of whatever food store is, is where the bargains are. And I also don't like how it's called the bulk bin section because it, it's not about buying tons of food, it's about buying the right amount of food. And wherever there, there is that customization factor, I think that, that we do better because one size doesn't fit all. Yeah, so I, I also hear your point about, you know, getting the, the most calories for your dollar and the most bang for your buck. And I think that everyone has a decision to make. You know, I think we should be able to choose how we, we buy our food and, and choose the solution that fits us best. And so, yeah, there is some privilege in being able to say, let's get past that model but I think it's one that, that leads to greater health. So if we can do that, then I think we should. And, and I'm not trying to prescribe how people should live their lives. Uh, I'm trying to raise this issue and think about how we can be part of the solution. But certainly there are different situations in our own lives where you, know, you might not be able to, to rethink value. Uh, but if you think on the large scale, on our, our lifespan, and you, you factor in health implications, then I think it's, it's something that, that does kind of come back. Maybe we are spending a little more of our household income on food, but it's, it's not leading to health problems, which then have their own costs uh, and on a personal level and on a national level. So um, thank you so much, Jonathan. We just have, we can give Jonathan a round of applause. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.